Good evening, one and all. It is a, a, a wonderful thing to be able to close out our day gathering, singing God's praises, uh, learning more from God's word. Uh, before we uh, stand for the call to worship, just reminders about some of the activities of the week. Uh, I would ask you all to, uh, to keep in prayer about Presbytery meeting this Saturday. A uh, number of us will be traveling up there to do that wonderful work. <laughs> And uh, it'll be encouraging to find out what's, what's been happening in the lives of the different churches and the ministries that we, that we support. Um, also, on Saturday, a reminder that uh, it is a day of prayer for the church in Uganda. Uh, that, that sheet that we put out, I was amazed the number of reformed churches um, that are in, in that nation. So uh, there are uh, people that are hurting you know, in that circumstance. Uh, as well, uh, Wednesday, ladies' Bible study in the morning, and then the men's theological study uh, in the evening where we will wrestle with uh, the beginning of uh, Machen's uh, work. We're, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary. What's really interesting is um, that book has aged very well. Uh, it, it, it just, when you get into it, um, it is as current today as it was 100 years ago. So uh, the, the themes and the, and the problems that he was able to recognize and, and, and write about and speak about in, in the church. So uh, if you're able to make it, please read. If you haven't read, I would come anyway because I think it's going to be pretty interesting conversations and discussions. So that's my promotion for that. Please stand as we uh, uh, come before the Lord and worship our call to worship is from Psalm 113. Hear these words of praise. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forward and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So let's join in singing as we open up our worship this evening with him. 38, uh, immortal, invisible, God only wise. <laughs> evening it is our desire to be encouraged in our faith you have promised Lord that when we gather Lord you are with us uh, so we cling to that precious promise uh, Lord you are the maker and sustainer of all things we have uh, read many of your attributes or sung many of your attributes in this hymn and uh, they remind us of your power and your glory the, uh, the fact that you do not change uh, Lord, you are a God worthy of our praise, worthy of our trust, and it is in you and you alone that we find our peace and find our hope. So, Lord, teach us this day as we uh, f 
from the, by the preaching of your word. Lord, help us to offer the praises that you alone deserve. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's next turn to uh, hymn 303, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. It's our hymn of the month. seated. Our scripture reading is, uh, this evening is taken from Acts chapter 13 as we are working our way uh, through the book of Acts. Uh, just a reminder that we are in the middle of a description and of um, an encounter of Paul and Barnabas in Antioch as they have gone into the synagogue and are uh, presenting the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, so we have opportunity to read what the reaction to that was. So be reading from Acts 13, verses 42 to the end of the chapter. Uh, please attend to the Lord's, the reading of God's word. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city 
stirring up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Our hymn sing tonight uh, is... Uh, a thematic one in which we'll be uh, singing hymns regarding the word of God. The first hymn is hymn 139. You may re remain seated as I take my seat. 139, your word is like a garden, Lord. Turn now to um, 148 as we continue with this theme of uh, the Word of God. Um, triumphant, these three um, hymns is um, 146, Break Thou the Bread of Life, 146.
Let's bow for prayer. Oh Lord our God, we do recognize your great provision to us in the word of God, flesh, Lord, of Christ. In some ways, the word of God is, comes to us through Christ. And uh, the great Logos, Lord, we, uh, we thank you that it's scriptured for us and we find it before us as we open our Bibles. It is all from page to page and cover to cover. Uh, the word that speaks to us, the word, Lord, by which through your spirit you bless and instruct us and discipline us. Lord, we are refreshed in your word and reminded in your word. Lord, in your word and your promises, we set great hope and we are thankful that you have preserved it over the ages and kept it. Lord God, we are well aware that there are many who doubt your word, many who even more than ever perhaps denigrate your word and think poorly of it and find it um, uh, even a matter of sport, if not a matter of, of exegetical science to um, separate and to, and to criticize and uh, to make uh, difficulty with. Uh, but Lord, your people have always uh, proved the truth of your scriptures. And we are delighted to read it each day and Lord strengthened and blessed by it. And we pray that it might go forth, not only from this congregation and from our lips, to our children, to our family, to friends, to those who you providentially put before us. But also, O oh Lord God, we, we're thankful that by your missionaries and by churches throughout the world, this same word, it goes out and Lord is very effective. It is the means by which you call many to yourself and build your church. We're thankful to be a part of that. We're thankful to be able to support such missionaries. We do pray for them. We pray again for this uh, for Leah Hop, one of our missionary of the, of the month, Lord, of laboring in Uganda. We thank you uh, for her, um, her wisdom, which she takes uh, to that field helping with the children, but also helping in the villages and teaching. Lord God, we um, pray that your word might find a greater place in the heart of those you have called to rule us as our um, earthly um, legislators and congressmen, Lord, senators and judges, uh, Lord, cabinet members, our president, and Lord, we desire that they might uh, be much in your word. Lord, we, we know that there have been presidents in this country who were very familiar with your word and often read it and made it a part of their lives. Lord, we, we wish that would be the case today too and pray that it would be. Lord, we know that if we were a nation guided by your word, guided by you in that manner, we would have a, a, much, uh, a much finer place and a much brighter light uh, to share with the world. And so, Lord, we do pray that even in our nation, your word might be honored. Father, we um, pray for those who are in need of your grace um, and know thankful that they are comforted by your word as they are um, suffering in various matters, matters of physical ailment. We continue to pray as we did this morning for such as Bob, uh, Bob Gramp and Tracy Morris and Jim Roush, Lord. We, we are thankful to see um, Elder Fenton here again and, and uh, that um, Elder Sipe was here this morning and Elder Mixner. We pray for each of them. <clears throat> Lord, we would also pray for... Um, Deacon um, uh, Rich Dugan, who, Lord, uh, will be led by your word, e even in his life, uh, as he looks at um, possible jobs. You'll give him wisdom, Lord. Lord, we all need wisdom in day-to-day -day decisions, and we, we pray for him and pray that you would honor and bless him. Um, 
we um, pray for uh, uh, Geneva, Lord, not with us. Lord, is she away, I think, perhaps? And uh, we pray for her. We, Lord, we uh, uh, thank you for those who are engaged, uh, for, the, for Tyler and Megan Church and Ian McArdle and Laura Hamm. Um, Father, we pray for your blessing in the week before us. May it be a week in which we find rest and wisdom in your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to turn now to, um, to the scriptures, to the word. Um, <clears throat> uh, last week, looking in Acts chapter 6, we saw how God delights in the unlikely. <laughs> um, how an unlikely convert was met in an unlikely place by a very unlikely Savior. Um, well, this evening's account is even more unlikely. A, a third a party, a party account of the conversion of the Apostle Paul, known then as Saul of Tarsus. So turn to Acts chapter 9. We're working our way through the book of the Acts of the Apostles and reading through it. The readings are a little ahead of the, of the, um, of the scripture um, preaching, but um, that's good. It sort of warms us up. So we're in chapter 9 and, uh, of the um, book of Acts, and uh, we begin with the first verse and read through the 19th. Um, Acts 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but, not see, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the a house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision. Um, uh, and he's uh, seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight 
And then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Lord God, open our eyes to see the wonder of your word. We pray in Christ. Amen. <clears throat> well, on one hand, uh, wouldn't it uh, have seemed that uh, a very likely thing, not unlikely, but very unlikely for Saul to have uh, named Jesus as Messiah from the, uh, from the outset? I mean, after all, Saul was a learned religious man, well-versed in the writings of the law and the prophets. Um, and of all, uh, to, to testify uh, of the Lord, shouldn't, uh, uh, shouldn't it have been Saul? I mean, uh, shouldn't have he have been the first uh, to embrace Jesus as Messiah and recognize this was the one? Uh, but he was not. And in fact, at the outset, he was the church's greatest enemy. As he first appears, us, appears to us in the scripture, uh, Saul is in fact a very disagreeable and unattractive man. Uh, here he is uh, guarding the clothes of those who stripped off their, their coats. We read that in the previous uh, chapter. And, um, and, uh, uh, and he does that so that they might have more freedom to, to stone to death the first Christian martyr, the godly Stephen. But, but he wasn't just guarding the coats, mind you, because Acts 1.8 records that he was there giving approval, uh, giving approval to uh, what was happening in, before his eyes. And in the third uh, verse of the same chapter, we read that while godly men were busy mourning for Stephen, uh, Saul, uh, quoting the text, was, quote, ravaging the church, entering house uh, after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. But it, it gets even worse by his own admission. These are Saul's own words. Persecuted uh, the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, 22.4. Or in another place, he, he writes, on the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many times, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. Well, that's chapter 26. And here we are in our text in chapter 9, reading that uh, he's breathing out threats, breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So this is what we find in our first encounter with Saul of Tarsus, a man who was absolutely consumed. He was possessed uh, a man who was going far beyond the call of duty, if you will. A man who poured his considerable energy and intellect into the business of relentlessly f ferreting out the infant New Testament church to destroy it. Uh, and he probably felt pretty good about it. He was, uh, appears to have been greatly dedicated to this goal. And this is a man who, who was who thought he was doing the will of God and was, in fact, doing nothing more than being a tool of the devil. So if the Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch were unlikely converts, what about this man, Saul? Uh, speaking um, about Jacob Marley, Scrooge's partner in Charles Dickens in the opening verses of his famous Christmas carol, he writes, quote, there could be no doubt that Marley was dead. Uh, this must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come from the story that I'm going to relate. Well, we might say the same thing of Saul. To get any benefit, anything good from this passage of scripture, it must be distinctly understood that Saul was dead as well. Now, you might ask, well, how was he dead? He wasn't dead. It appears he was quite dangerously alive. No, but he was really dead. He was spiritually dead, wasn't he? He was dead to the, to the reality of real life. He was dead to God. He was dead to Christ. He was dead to spiritual truth. He was ripe for judgment in the life to come. More importantly, you must understand that he was dead 
to grace. He was dead to grace. And I urge you to listen carefully uh, to be certain that you're not a little dead to grace as well. Um, inevitably, I might say, uh, ironically, that um, a man uh, who is dead to God and dead to grace is a person who typically, very often, is alive to the law. And that's to say, a person who is very keen on the law of God, but doesn't really understand anything of the great place and purpose of the law. Um, someone who, like the Pharisees and the scribes of that day, who, who went beyond the law, they amended the law to further guard loto save, to, to guard against uh, um, any sort of uh, transgressing against the law. They fenced it even further. Um, in their zeal, um, uh, they had added even more rules and self-imposed guidelines uh, with which, uh, which they regard to be more than, than just boundaries, but, but in themselves a way of righteousness. It, the only way of pleasing God, the only way was strict obedience uh, to, to Saul, uh, strict obedience to these self-imposed laws and especially all of the rabbinical uh, interpretations of the law had become to, to them the very essence of religion. And that, that's why he was so maniacal in his opposition to Jesus and his followers because the focus of the early Christians wasn't upon the law, which they did greatly revere, and certainly not upon the temple, as was in the case with Saul, but upon Jesus and his gospel, which uh, was and is the true essence of saving faith and religion. Remember again who this man Saul is. He, he's a Jew of the diaspora, uh, probably bought to, brought to Jerusalem by, by devout parents who, who want him to get the best of education. And so uh, they, 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 they bring him in... in um, and he studies with the renowned Gamaliel, a rabbi and teacher who is incidentally still studied and honored by Jewish scholars to this very day, Gamaliel. And he, and he joins the party of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of, um, of Judaism of that day. These are his words. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Saul uh, did them all, you see. He was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. That means that, that <clears throat> though he might have spoken about grace, let's define grace as the undeserved favor of God. And the Pharisees spoke about that in effect. But in practice, Saul's religion, to say it again, his understanding of God, the way he lived, was altogether a matter of works, of performance, um, of his own good record, a matter of his own merit that he achieved at the cost of zeal uh, and ordinances. You see, a system that Saul rightly perver uh, perceived to be under attack by the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ and his followers. Um, Jesus often took uh, the Pharisees to task. Uh, he would say th things like this to the Pharisees. He would say, you, woe, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgent. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Now, Jesus wasn't saying bad things about the law. Jesus himself was very careful to keep the law, but he understood the purpose of the law. And, and what he meant here was that the scrupulous keeping of the law in itself was nothing more than an external show if it didn't reach the heart. Uh, it didn't reach the heart of a man. So, you see, probably looked pretty good on the outside. People thought, oh, Saul, I mean, there's the measure, isn't it? He's the man. Uh, so far as his observance of Sabbath rules or tithing rules or rules regarding the temple, ceremonial cleanliness, 
But in his heart, he was a mess. He was a filthy disgrace to God. Lost to him was the essence of the law, which should have led him to the lawgiver himself, uh, to the son of the risen Lord, uh, uh, even Jesus Christ. But, but remember what I told you, uh, that Saul was blind to all of that. Uh, he just didn't see it that way. Uh, Saul, what Saul, uh, Saul saw, so far as Jesus and the early Christians was concerned, were a lot of people who were throwing off the law, uh, who they supposed could be right with God by simply confessing and following Jesus. Saul didn't understand that because he didn't understand grace, you see. And he hated the smell of it. In fact, there's nothing that can, that can enrage a real legalist more than the sweet smell of the freedom of grace. And that's what he smelled. And that explains why he was so angry and so filled with self-righteous zeal against the followers of Christ. To Saul whose whole life was built upon laborious pains of back-breaking legalism and, and careful uh, adherence um, uh, to every detail of the Jewish law to saw the message of free grace, of total forgiveness and adoption by God and eternal life freely given, well, that was an absolute outrage. That was blasphemous. It was a howling attack on everything he stood for. And he meant to do everything he could to stop it. But it's hard to fight against God. As Jesus said it, it's hard to kick against the pricks. And um, when he stopped Saul dead on the Damascus Road, um, Saul began to understand. Well, Saul is off on his murderous errand, one of his errands, and he, and he has in hand this document from the high priests in Jerusalem giving him authority to arrest and drag off and persecute the Jewish Christians in Damascus. So he's hustling down the road uh, when God jerks him uh, to a halt. A blinding, flashing light comes down around him, and he falls to the ground. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Jesus makes it so personal. <laughs> you're persecuting me, Saul. And, and the man who thought all along that he stood in the light suddenly came to the terrible realization that he had, in fact, all the while been walking in terrible, cursed darkness. He had not been defending the faith. He had not been pleasing God. He had not even been properly upholding the law. He had been persecuting the followers of Jesus and persecuting Jesus himself. He's told that very clearly. And he was all wrong. Wrong about the place and purpose of the law. Wrong about all the prophecies which he ignored or misinterpreted. But most devastatingly of all, he had been wrong about Jesus. Think of it. Here's a man, self-assured, uh, filled with self-righteous importance. A man on a mission who suddenly and is completely undone. Um, uh, with the knowledge that all of these years he had been dead wrong, completely self-deceived and an enemy of God. He stands up because Jesus orders him to stand up and he, he's blind, yeah. And, and now he understands he's been blind all along. There in front of him was the Messiah resurrected from the, the grave after all in all of his glory. How could he have been so blind? It was not his righteousness, after all, that could please God. It was the righteousness of Christ alone that was sufficient. It was not the blood of, of bulls and goats that made atonement for sin, but the blood of Christ on the cross. That alone was sufficient. I don't mean to say that, that Saul necessarily understood all of this, but he put it all together, 
in time and not too long. And, uh, and he writes about us, he writes about it, because he gives us these beautiful passages. In, in the book to the Romans, for example, he write, later writes, uh, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they might be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own righteousness. They did not uh, submit uh, uh, to, to the righteousness of God. Uh, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Romans 10, 1 to 4. Well, that was Saul. Zealous for God, oh yes, but not according to knowledge. Saul rather was seeking to establish his own righteousness and his own ideas and his own misguided sense through the power of the flesh, that's to say, through his own unassisted human effort and human thinking, seeking to establish his own record his own depository of merit through the keeping of the law, never understanding the futility of it all, never understanding the depth of, of his sin against the high holiness of, of God. And worst of all, rejecting the sacrificial death and truly meritorious life of Christ, which was the rejection of the righteousness of Christ and persecuting Christ and his precious people. Well, <clears throat> this is what we need to understand as well, that through the works of the law, no one, uh, no man or woman will be justified, but only through the righteousness of Christ. You know this. Uh, we're imputed, uh, freely credited uh, with the righteousness of Christ when we humbly apply to it f uh, through grace, which alone finds favor in the sight of God. For by grace you're saved, through faith, the gift of God, so that we won't boast. Grace, yes, that, and mercy. That's the second thing I want to speak of this evening. Uh, we're taught and reminded about mercy in this text as well as, as grace. For, for here's Saul, uh, the scourge of the, of the early New Testament church, the chief of sinners, as he later calls himself, and he meant that. It was not simply a... a Appear, something to appear modest. Uh, here he is, ruined, undone, with the blood of the church fairly dripping from his hands, and God suddenly meets him, stops him cold, and not for the sake of vengeance, as well he might have expected. God does not deal with his enemies as Saul dealt with his. Um, uh, Saul threw his enemies into prison and sought their death with pleasure. Uh, Jesus transforms his enemies into loving friends and ushers them uh, into heaven. In mercy, God stops Saul to extend to him what? His loving mercy. Mercy to the church, mercy to Paul. Let's begin to call him uh, Paul now. Well, Uninvited, <laughs> Jesus uh, sovereignly breaks into this wretched man's life and, and mercifully spares him and then commissions him to take the gospel of all people to the Gentiles. There's a little humor in that, I think, isn't there? Can you imagine this? Saul, the, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, the, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, ministering to unwashed Gentiles. But it isn't Saul anymore anyway. It's a new man. It's, it's, it's Paul. Uh, uh, God takes away the scales from his eyes and, and regenerates him and makes him alive. God says, Paul, I have a message of grace and mercy uh, to you who now personally understand something about grace and mercy. Uh, here you are to take this message and to the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Acts 26. So 
<clears throat> this is a, a beautiful message, uh, but it's not an easy message in many ways, is it? It means telling people um, who all of their lives have been living in darkness, who all their lives have believed the satanic lie that uh, not our own, that, that in our own efforts, in our own good lives, in our own religious system will be sufficient to, to assure them of a good outcome with God and a good future life. And all of that is not true. It means telling them that they're blind. It means telling our little children these things. They don't get it either because they're programmed uh, from the garden uh, all about works. You know, make mommy and daddy happy and everything will be fine. But they can't do that, so, you know, everything's not fine. And, you, and they need to learn about grace, too. And it's never easy. Um, it, it's it's um, it, that people are headed in the wrong direction and to a terrible end. But it's, but it's very hard to hear that because grace is something that's just so very foreign to our way of thinking. We don't understand grace. And we resist the idea of grace. I always put it this way, that grace doesn't load up on our computers. Maybe that's a modern way of, you know, the, the law works on, loads up lickety split. But uh, try to, to load uh, grace into our hearts. And there's always uh, some, some resistance. Uh, uh, we, we understand works, we understand the law, we understand tit for tat, we understand that you, you do well at work and you get pats on the back and you do badly and perform badly and you get slips and are told to leave, empty your desk. <laughs> well, uh, we understand about getting justice, uh, about getting what we deserve. Um, if there's going to be any mercy, well, we'd like to see see it qualified by, the, by a jolly good effort at the very least, right? So we're sort of like the older brother in, in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son who thinks that uh, sending his supposedly repentant younger brother uh, to live and work with the family certains, the servants would probably be a pretty good and prudent plan. And by the way, the younger son thought that probably was what should happen as well. Which suggestion is rejected out of hand by his father, who instead pours gifts and, and restores him immediately as his son without so much as a question. Well, the gospel um, simply says, humble yourself, cast all of your deadly doing on him down at Jesus' feet and commit yourself in faith to Christ and his righteousness. So here's the conclusion of it. The unlikely story uh, of Saul shows us, proves to us, that the present time uh, uh, at this point in the timeline or dispensation, if you will, the door is still open. Uh, uh, God is still conquering his enemies in a surprising way by condemning them to death for sin and then executing on the cross in, in Jesus our substitute and, and then raising us up with him to behold his glory and, and bear witness to his grace. And, and, and to make the gospel very clear to us and very compelling, he causes it to be written down uh, and to write down this, this account, uh, there is a remarkable account of Saul of Tarsus. Write it down so that we can read about this man, of all men, who God uses as one of the great trophies of his grace. And we shake our heads. And, and we wonder, together with the, <laughs> with the disciple named Ananias, verses 10 to 14, who Jesus sends to assist the bewildered Saul. Uh, what is this? But there it is, right in front of us, this, this glorious testimony of grace and mercy. But it is written down, a glorious text of full of grace and mercy. So, uh, brothers and sisters, let's rejoice in this and, and let us ever be aware uh, that the truth and freshness of Jesus' gospel of grace uh, is, is what it is, and beware should it ever become too simplistic 
or alien or maybe even somewhat repugnant to our hearts. Let us uh, cast that thought away and, 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 and quickly remind ourselves of the goodness and the mercy of grace. Um, let's pray. Lord our God, thank you for this um, delightful picture of, of your grace. Uh, here, Lord, is a man who we might identify more than we think. Lord, there is within all of us a, a, a heart that wants to go back to, uh, to the law in ways to, to justify ourselves, Lord, to, uh, to make ourselves like that cup uh, shining on the outside. But we know too well that it is only your grace and mercy that makes us acceptable and rejoices our heart. It is only your gospel that saves and your gospel that delights and your gospel that, that keeps us in Christ. Lord, may we, may we remember that and, and not in any way uh, look down upon uh, your gospel as being too simplistic or alien or repugnant to our hearts in any way. But may it uh, be ever installed as uh, the great gospel of truth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Time for eats, right? Oh, no, that's the morning. All right. Let's conclude with hymn number um, 483. I, I always wait to, to sing this hymn because... This is the, exactly the right text to sing this hymn for. 486, we sing the glorious, excuse me, 483, we sing the glorious conquest. 483. Let's stand to sing. Receive on your heads God's uh, special uh, blessing. 
Uh, may God himself, the, the God of all peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who called you is faithful, and he will do it. Hey there, what's so funny? <laughs>